Hello and welcome to River City Online.
Hello and welcome to River City Online. We're excited to have you join us today. As we get started, please take a moment and say hi. Hi. In the chat and let us know that you're here. We anticipate that we will experience God's presence today as we worship together. Feel free to connect to your host or ask for prayer at any time during the service. And you have a great day.
Hey everybody, welcome to River City Online. Pastor Kevin here. We, uh, I wanna share with you from a, a passage in 2 Kings 22 and a bit in 23. And it's entitled, the message today is entitled, Hearts on Fire. Uh, look at these few verses here. Proverbs 4, 23 says, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. And then Luke 24, 32, remember the context here is, this is post the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is, is, comes alongside two of his disciples as they're walking along this road. And look what, the, look what they say as they, these disciples reflect on what happened that they said to each other. Didn't our hearts burn within us as we talked, as he talked with us on the road and explained the scripture to us? Speaking of Jesus, at the, at the time they didn't recognize the post-resurrected Jesus, but as they were reflecting back on it, they're like, our hearts were on fire. There's something about fire in our heart and God. And I, I, that's, as I was praying for us today, that's what I, I felt the Lord was like, Kevin, talk to about about your relationship with God being like a fire, like like even like a campfire. Recently at a men's retreat, uh, Rowan and I, my son, we we were uh, at, at, you know around the campfire a few times, and one of the the guys there, uh, Rob McDonald, said, "Hey, Rowan, have you ever built a campfire?" And and uh, he said, "I haven't." And so he showed him how to do it. And it was so cool how he just took him through the process, and they built a fire, and just that learning that process of getting the moss, and getting the kindling, getting the wood, and getting the right angles, and all that, really cool. And uh, and what's important about a campfire, as you know, is once it gets started, you got to pay attention to it, and you got to keep adding fuel or wood to the fire. Not too much. How you prop it up makes uh, makes a difference. There's all these little elements to it. And um, and I was thinking about the fire, the campfire, being analogous to our relationship with God and our walk with God and how, uh, you know, it gets started. And then I even drew you a picture here. Uh, I want to just show you here. In, in our relationship with God, our heart's on fire. Uh, we, we, we start this relationship with Jesus. We surrender our lives to Christ because of what he accomplished on the cross. We can receive a grace gift. And then our heart starts burning for God. And then it gets stronger as we invest and grow in him and we learn his word and we're reading the word and we're fellowshipping and we're, uh, we're, we're, part of connecting in the local church and we're worshiping God on a daily basis. And, and as we're f putting, uh, if you would, wood on that fuel of our relationship with God, it starts to burn stronger and stronger until this point where it's like, man, you're just like white hot. Now you're not just only uh, doing your personal devotional times, but you're beginning to share your faith and you're investing in making disciples. And that daily connection is happening regularly. But then what happens is sometimes things come in because we're not just, uh, we aren't, we're in a world where there's resistance. The enemy there, we have our flesh to resist. We have the, the devil and the world to resist. There's outside influences as well as even our own challenges with our own flesh that, that resist this fire burning. And so if you don't pay attention, if you neglect it, it'll start to, your relationship with God will start to decline. Sin enters in, or you give in to sin, and, and, and you don't confess and repent, and so all of a sudden there can be a decline. And where it's almost like that, if you think about a fire, this is like where it's roaring and lots of wood on the fire and then it starts to burn and burn and burn and it's, there's, there's movement to it. And it, you can even get to that place where it's just down to barely any coals or just a few glowing coals. And, and I want to talk to you today about, I want to look at this story of King Josiah and what we saw in, in that story that we could glean to help us in our keeping the fire hot in our lives. And so let me give you some context of this passage. Uh, just backing out 30,000 foot, King Saul, first king of Israel, and he fashions the 12 tribes into a nation. Uh, he didn't end his, his reign good, it was, it was tough. Uh, and then King David, who was known as a man after God's own heart, 
He had a lot of good in there. He had some bad mixed in there. But overall, he was one who worshiped God and had a heart after God. He, he struggled with sin. He had times in his, when his, the fire of his relationship with God was declining and uh, he was distracted and he wasn't doing what God called him to do. And then his son, King Solomon, in, inherits the kingdom and it was really united at the time. It was doing well. And he does well for much of his reign, but, but he, at the end, he gets distracted by, uh, he, had, he had a bunch of wives, too many, uh, just crazy. And then he started worshiping uh, false gods, at, at, you know, making high places for other gods, which was just hard to fathom. But he let idols and false worship enter in there. And he also starts building his empire and, and taxing the people heavily. And then his son, Rehoboam, he, he continues the heavy taxing. And it's at this point where the, the kingdoms divide and the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, 10 tribes in the north and two tribes in the south, they divide over this taxation. And, and, and then there's so much wickedness. There's so much false worship. There's so much pagan worship. It, it got really ugly. There was sacrificing of children. And it was awful, like really bad. As a matter of fact, there was 19 kings in, uh, in the north and 19 kings in the south, the Israel and, and Judah. And, and if we break those down, I mean, um, the 19 kings in Israel were all evil. They all did evil in the sight of the Lord. And of the 19 kings in the south, about eight of them did right in the sight of the Lord. Well, one of those kings is Josiah. And so we want to look at his story and, and it's, you, can, you can find this and you can find the king, Second Kings uh, and also Second Chronicles chronologically goes through all these kings. And it's, it's quite a read. It's, sometimes it's hard to read because it's just so much negative. Uh, but it helps us see what they were working with. And so let's look at this uh, passage. First, before we dive into Second Kings, I want to read to you a passage from Deuteronomy because as I was reflecting on this story, um, there was instruction that these kings didn't take. Look at Deuteronomy 17. This is under a heading entitled Instructions to Kings to Govern Well. So this is back in the law, right? It says, also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy speaking to kings. This is like instructions for kings to govern well. Look what it says. It shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of the law and in a book from the one before the priests and the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of his law, of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So God is specifically telling kings, go make a personal copy of the Bible, do it before the priests, make a hand copy, read it daily, get in it. And when you do this, you will, you will nurture this fear of the Lord. You will observe the words of the law. It's saying, stay in the Bible every day, king. Have your own personal copy right by your bed. Read it all the time. Well, as far as we can tell from scripture, none of the kings, none of those 19 kings in the north or the south did any of that. They did, none of them did it officially. They, they didn't. And so, and so what happens is you see the, the drift of their fire uh, go down to nothing, to the point it was, it was out, completely out. Not even some, a few embers. No, completely out. But in the history, God's moving. He does move. And despite that, and, and some, we're going to see Josiah as one of those kings. And so I want to talk to you about personal revival and, and how getting her heart on fire. So let's look at, and it's my first point, is that personal revival, uh, don't let your past, let your past rather fuel your future. Let your past fuel your future. Second Kings 22, 1 to 2. We're into Second Kings now, finally. Josiah was eight years old, King Josiah, when he became king, and he reigned 31 years, eight years old. He was only eight. <laughs> uh, his mother's name was uh, Jedidah, the daughter of Adiai of Boscath, and he did what was right, speaking of Josiah, in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. So King Josiah, he, he give a little summation here. He's only eight when he takes over, right? Which is crazy. Uh, he leads the, one of the greatest revivals these people have ever seen since King David. And, and so we can learn something from, from King Josiah's life. He, it says here in that passage that he did right in the sight of the Lord. So he, he, he didn't let his history, uh, the history of, of the people, including his father, and 
his father's father, his grandfather, who, Manasseh, who was one of the most wicked kings. Josiah's dad was Ammon, Ammon, who reigned only two years and then was murdered. And it says about him that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And then Manasseh was known, he reigned for 55 years. He was known as one of the most wicked kings of Israel. And, um, and as a matter of fact, this is what it says about uh, Manasseh in 2 Kings 21, 9. But the people refused to listen and Manasseh led them to do even more evil than the pagan nations that the Lord had destroyed when the people of Israel had entered the land. So when they entered the promised land and were destroying the nations that were doing evil inside of the Lord, this king, um, he actually did more and led them to do more evil than all those other nations. I mean, that's, that's crazy. So this is like, this is Josiah's legacy, his father and grandfather, right? And so my point is, is that don't let your past, don't let your past hold you back, but let it be fuel for your future. I love that Josiah flies in the faith of his history, of his past, of his legacy. He's like, okay, listen, I'm going to look back to David and what, how he reigned and how he ruled and how he worshiped God. And I'm going to do that. And so uh, that I think is so important to be careful that you don't let your legacy hold you back. Now, your legacy can fuel you, uh, especially if it's a healthy legacy. But even if it's a bad legacy, God can take the negative things from your past and he can redeem those. And that's what, only what God can do. He can let that be fuel or wood to the fire, right? And I see it all the time. I see people, especially those who've been battling addictions or struggled in addictions and have a history of that, they take that and they help others who are wrestling with the same things. For instance, that's a good example. And so God can take our past and use it as fuel for the future. And so a few years later, um, uh, King Josiah, he, he doesn't let his history box him in. Um, and he is, God is stirring his heart to follow him and lead the people to do the same. And he's adding fuel to the fire and he leads the people to repair the temple. The temple's basically been used as a warehouse. Uh, he, he's, cause he's the king in, jo in Judah in the Southern uh, kingdom. And the temple's there in Jerusalem, and, and he's, it's basically just be, it's like a warehouse. It's just being, it's not, it's not functioning as an active place of worship. And so he's like, okay, let's get the temple repaired. So he leads a group of people to do that. And as they're repairing, in the process of repairing and the cleanup, there's something that's discovered. Look what's discovered in 22, 2 Kings 22, 8 to 9. Then Hilkiah the high priest said to uh, Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. <laughs> and Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Shaphan, and he read it. And so Shaphan, the scribe, went to the king, bringing the king the word, saying, your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house, have delivered into the hand of those who do the work. So they're helping pay those who are repairing and getting the temple up to speed and who, and who oversee the house of the Lord. But what, what he's saying here is we actually found the scriptures. We found the book of the law. We found the Bible. So even the high priest didn't know where the Bible was, where the scriptures were. That tells you how bad it was. They had lost the word of God. They had lost God's love letter. They had lost the guidebook. And that, that is awful. So what, what's, what's my second point? So my first point is, you know, don't let, remember when personal revival is happening, we need to let our past fuel. Don't let it hold you back, but let it be fuel for the future. And then secondly, personal revival starts by returning to the word of God. It, if you've lost the word of God, maybe your Bible sits on your shelf and it's dusty, uh, get it off the shelf. <laughs> or if you've never, you don't have the Bible, get the Bible. I mean, but open it up, read it, read it on your phone, read it on your app, listen to it. Get the word of God back in your environment, in your rhythm, in your presence. All right, look at 2 Kings 22, 10 to 11. It says, then Shaphan the scribe showed the king saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it. Uh, before the king. Okay, pay attention to these words. Look at it on the screen. And Shaphan read it before the king. And now it happened when the king, speaking of Josiah, heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. He's like, ah, he, he's, what does that mean? What does, what does that mean? He, it means as, as the word, as the scripture is being read to the king, he, he feels the presence of God come on him. And he's, there's sorrow and and repentance and it's hitting him hard. It's like, oh my goodness, this is the word of God. And it's, he's, he's just King Josiah, <laughs> the king of Judah is hearing the word of God for the first time, for the first time up to this point, he had not heard it. He'd heard about it, but he'd never heard it read. And so 
this hearing of the word moves him to repentance. It's deeply emotional. It, it's, it, it, it's the word of God is revealing the sin. I'm sure his own personal sin, but also the sin of the nation. And so he's feeling the weight of this as the leader of the nation. He's, he's going, ah, he's seeing it. He's feeling it. There's conviction. This big aha for, for Josiah is, is hitting him. And this is like, the worst and most serious thing uh, that our sin, and he's, he's starting to see what uh, the, the, the altars of Baal and Asherah and all the pagan worship and all those things that were just normal, had become normal in their society. He's starting to see as they're repairing the temple and the, the, the scriptures are found. It's like, ah, oh, what, what, what have we done? What has happened? We've fallen so far from God. Our, the, the fire has gone out. And there's, so this stirring begins to happen. And the conviction of sin really is the special work of the Holy Spirit. And as now, if we fast forward to us today as New Testament believers, if you're a believer in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you and the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin. Well, the Holy Spirit is convicting, uh, I believe, clearly here, Josiah of sin, not only personally, but nationally. And um, and so what happens is, is uh, look at, look at, well, look, look at John 16, eight to nine. It says, when he, the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit will convict uh, the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me, speaking of Jesus. And so back, going back now to King Josiah, King Josiah in response to the hearing of the word, the reading of the word and the hearing of the word and the finding of it goes, go, go let's go find a prophet. Uh, and, and they actually, they go to hold of the prophetess and this prophetess, they say, go inquire of the Lord. Look at verse 13 uh, for me, for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So he's got, we got to get a word from the God. We got to get a word from the Lord. Go, go inquire of the prophet and the prophetess. And, sh and they do that. They find a prophetess, hold her. In verses 15 to 19, I'm going to read this very fast to you. Um, I won't unpack too much of it, but let me just read it to you. Then she said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, speaking of the king, Josiah, thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring calamity on this place and all its inhabitants. I mean, this gets intense. All the words of the book, which the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and burnt incense to other gods, and they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be aroused against this place and shall not be quenched. But as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord in this manner, you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which you have heard, because you your, listen, look at this, lean into verse 19, because your heart was tender, speaking of the King Josiah's heart, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse, and you tore your clothes and you wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. See what the, the prophetess hold it is, uh, you know, delivering a word from God to King Josiah, uh, saying, I see the king's heart. I see the heart that is repentive, that is, it is sorrowful, not just sorrowful and sad and sorry, but, but godly repentance leads you to a place of coming to God and going, God, I'm really deeply sorry. And I want to turn from those ways. I want to change the direction. I don't want to just keep heading the way we've been going. I want to repent, which turns from that heading towards death and destruction, turn back to you, God. The direction of your heart changes. And so King Josiah is tenderhearted, he's humble, he repents, and, and he gets this word that lets him know, listen, there's still gonna be judgment, but, but, I, but I, God sees you, Josiah, he sees you. Keep going in the direction you're going, keep going towards God. And so that fire gets stoked in Josiah and it's burning for God and it's getting hotter and hotter and the heat is impacting those around him. And look what happens as that heat of the fire in his heart for God is radiating out. Third, third point is that personal revival grows and spreads to others. Look at verses one and two of chapter 23. Now the king sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him and the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in, look at this, and he, speaking of King Josiah, he, the king, Josiah, he reads in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. 
So Josiah gathers the leaders and the influencers and the people together. He gathers them around. He takes them to the house of the Lord, to the temple. And he personally, he didn't have somebody else read it. He personally felt so convicted and so, you know, recognized his influence and his authority. And he said, listen, I'm, and he, because he, he's not just thinking this is a nice idea. He's got, his heart is on fire and he's burning for God. And so he's going to read the word of God to the people, to the leaders and the influencers, as well as all the people. He's going to go, I'm going to read this. And so that's why I just want to encourage all of us. If you're a parent, read scripture to your kids. Let your kids read scripture to you. Talk about it. Get in it. Do it every day. Get to do it regularly. You've got to let the word of God that's living and active penetrate your heart and reveal the thoughts and intentions of your heart. Just like Josiah is doing here with the people. Up to this point, he'd never even heard it or read it, right? He'd heard about it, I'm sure, some. But it was so far removed from him. His dad didn't do it. His, his grandfather was the most wicked king uh, known uh, in Israel. I mean, man, this is awful. So Jeremiah 15, 16 says, They read from the book of the law of God and clearly explained the meaning of what was being read, helping the people understand each passage. Now, I'm just kind of giving you a little nugget out of Jeremiah. Look what it says there. It says they read it. So, and just like, just like Josiah is reading it to the people. And it says they clearly explained the meaning, uh, secondly, and they, were, it, they helped the people understand the passage. That's, that's exactly what we're doing here. We, we are, uh, you know, when we gather or we're watching online, we're, we're looking at the Word of God and we're helping you and I get in it. We're helping explain it and help apply, apply the scripture. This is biblical, what we're doing here. It's, right, it's biblical to get in the Bible and to teach the Bible and to preach the Bible, right? But you also do that personally and you can help others do it as you're discipling others too. You want to, of course, always encourage people to read it themselves, get in it, but also to help explain it and help them understand it, right? And as we discuss it in life groups and small group environments and one-on-one, and it's amazing what God will do do because it's living and active. All right. So when just like Josiah is having, a pers- is having a personal revival and his heart is burning hot for God. And as he's reading the word, f- fuel's getting added to the fire. It's getting hotter and hotter. And it's starting to spread to the people, to the leaders. Ooh, with this, and that's what happens. Personal revival doesn't stay personal. It starts to move out corporately and into the community. And you guys, that's what happens when we get in the Word of God, when we let it change us and and convict us. It's amazing what happens. Now, let's look at number four. Personal revival is marked by repentance. King Josiah is experiencing repentance here. He's taking the Word of God to the people. And and I want to just talk about this for a second because in 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly, pay attention here, worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Okay, so God, so conviction... Um, then should lead us to a place of confession and repentance, which is actually turning from uh, the, the, you start to feel sorry when you sin, but sorrow, just regular sor- feeling sorry isn't repentance. It leads us to repentance, All right? Godly sorrow, it says here, godly sorrow leads us away from sin and, and not only to salvation, but also to a place of repentance, which results uh, in growth. When we repent of our sin and go, God, I'm, I'm turning back to you and heading down that path. That's what Josiah is doing. That's what he's now influencing the nation to do with the people. And, and we're going to see that, that that is a beautiful thing. God repents is changing directions down a path. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? Cleanse us from all wickedness. And so if I went back to the, the chart here for a second, what you're going to find is as you're on this, as your heart is burning, and, and you go, man, I'm just doing so amazing. But then you get, and there's this decline season here. And the decline season, uh, one of the things that can bring that decline is unconfessed sin. Or, and, and man, it, it's, it's really a daily thing because sometimes you get offended because somebody says something or, or something happens to you that's unjust or unfair. And if you hold on to that unforgiveness or offense or, and then it grows into bitterness, it, it starts to influence and these walls start going up in your relationship with God. And then you, or you just stop reading the word and you just neglect your times with the Lord. And um, it doesn't change your salvation, but what it does is it changes your, your connection, your, your connection, your fellowship with God. And so it, it, your fire starts to drop down, right? And so 
repentance is going, acknowledging what's happening there, acknowledging where your heart's at. Guard your heart above all else, remember? For everything flows from it. And you start to acknowledge it. And when you repent, you begin a new cycle. It's like, it's like you repent and go, God, I confess. I'm, I'm sorrowful, yes, but I confess and repent. And all of a sudden you start a new life cycle again. And God begins to fuel that, your, the word of God begins to fuel the fire and your relationship with God is, becomes hotter and hotter. And so that's what happens. It, 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 personal revival uh, leads to this place of regular confession and repentance. And, um, and so look what happens in, in 2 Kings 23. I'm going to skip a few things, uh, a few verses I have here. But 2 Kings 23, uh, verse 3 says, The king stood by a pillar, made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in the book. And all the people took a stand. It says, all the people took a stand for the covenant. So not only is Josiah making a public commitment to go, I'm going to follow God with everything, all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. Ah! And I'm going to do what's in this word. I'm going to do it. I'm not just going to know about it. I'm going to activate it and do it. I love it. And so God's word brings this powerful response in Josiah. Not only that, it says here in verse 3 of 23, all the people took a stand for the covenant. And so, listen, the challenge is, is that on this side of the planet, we have the flesh, the world, and the devil that we're resisting. Right? We can be saved. We can be in Christ. Now let's fast forward to the New Testament. Jesus comes. He dies. Uh, he's buried. He rises again. He takes sin and its effect, and he pays the penalty and the price for it. Right? So look what Hebrews 10, 14 says. It says, for by this one offering, what Jesus did, his death on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection, he forever made perfect. He forever makes righteous or perfect those who are being made holy. I love this verse because it shows the process, the journey, the sanctification process that we're in. It's, it's the cycle. It's the life cycle of the fire. It's like, okay, we're in Christ. We're positioned. We're righteous. We're going to heaven. But there's this, this journey where our, our, you know, we can, we can re not resist the flesh or not resist the devil. And all of a sudden we sin and junk comes in and we're fighting and we're battling and we're hurting and and, and we, our, our hearts start to grow cold, right? And so we're not enjoying our fellowship with God, our relationship with God, and we're not reaching out to others and impacting them for, for the good news, with the good news of the gospel. And so the, just to be aware of the journey and embracing the process is key. And we need accountability. We need regular rhythms of confession and repentance. We, we need to communicate where we feel vulnerable. And we need prayer and encouragement and community and fellowship, you guys. It's one of the reasons it's so important to, to be a part of a local church and be in some kind of small group community and, and make sure you have a place where you can regularly not only confess to God, but someone you trust, you could confess your sin at James 5, 16, confess to them. And it, it's because it, it, it diffuses, it, it takes the water can off the fire. <laughs> And, 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 and it adds fuel to the fire. It's like when you, when you have encouragement from others or you're encouraging someone else, it's adding fuel to the fire, encouraging them in their walk with the Lord. And then, then the, let me give you another point here is that personal revival leads to greater freedom, freedom from idols, freedom from negative influence, freedom from sin issues, unforgiveness, bitterness, judgments. Verse four of chapter 23 it says, And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest, the priests of the second order, and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal, Baal for Asherah, and for all the hosts of heaven. Because they, they had they had dedicated stuff. They get dedicated the chariots to the sun gods. And they dedicated, they made horse statues and stuck them out in front of the temple and dedicated them to the, the stars. And they, they, they had every other thing that wasn't for, for the true God. And, and so he's saying, King Josiah is saying, go in there and clean house. As a matter of fact, in verse five, he says, get rid of the deceptive influences, uh, the idolatrous, he goes, remove any idolatrous priests. Uh, he, he, he says in verse seven, they tore down the living quarters of the male and female shrine prostitutes. They had shrine prostitutes uh, that were inside the temple of God. He's like, get rid of them, get rid of their living quarters, tear it all down. Uh, so he's dealing with sexual sin. He's dealing with idols. He's dealing with, uh, they, they were even sacrificing children to the God of Molech. I mean, they, they had a place for that. I mean, that, that's, it's just sick and wrong. 
and it's, it's grieving God's heart, but now Josiah is feeling God's heart because he's, he's heard the word of God and, and it's convicting him. And he's like, all right, we're gonna do a house cleaning, like a serious house cleaning, not only here in the temple, but all through the nation of Judah. And he even goes up into Israel and they do a serious sweep <laughs> and reform, a deep reform. And it, you can read it. I want you to go back and read it in chapter 22 and 23 because it gets really detailed and I don't have time today to get into all that. But I just want to encourage you, if we bring this to our personal lives, you might go, well, I don't worship idols, Kevin. Well, I'm, I'm grateful. I, I hope you don't. But we can make things idols in our lives. We can, we can, we can make uh, our families an idol. We can make our jobs an idol. Things that are good things, we can even make into idols if we're putting them before God, right? Uh, they don't have, and, and, and so sometimes it's that pursuit of money or pursuit of pleasure or pursuit of comfort can become an idol. And, and I'm, I'm trusting right now that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and, and even convicting you of sin, even convicting you of anything that may be dampening the fire of God and the fire of, of your relationship with him. Because he wants to add fuel to it. He wants to fuel it. As you get in the word and as you're, as you're reading it and meditating on it and letting it renew and transform your mind as you're applying it and you're confessing and repenting. Listen, today's a day to not just, just let the old stuff stay. It's to go, man, I need to get right with God. I need to repent of my sin. I need to deal with this stuff that I've just been letting creep in. Yeah, you know, like what, what's, your, what's your eyes watching? What are you looking at on a regular basis? What, what are you letting come in your eye gate? What are you letting come in your ear gate, right? What, what, what influences are you letting in? And that's what Josiah was doing. He was saying, let's look at, let's do an inventory of the stuff that we're just letting be here <laughs> and, and what we've allowed in and let's get rid of it. Let's do a house cleaning. And so I don't know what kind of house cleaning you need to do. You need to say, God, what do you want me to remove? What do you want me to get rid of? Is it a sexual sin? Is it, is it some kind of idol? Is it unforgiveness? What is it, God? I'm gonna pray for us. I'm gonna pray for you and I'm gonna pray for me. I'm gonna pray for us that we, would, that we would respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that we wouldn't ignore it, that we wouldn't go apathetic, that we wouldn't be numb, but we would say, God, I confess this and you fill it in the blank. You fill in that blank and you go, God, forgive me. I'm not just gonna be sorrowful, but by your grace and by your empowered, the Holy Spirit's empowerment, I'm gonna walk a different direction towards you, God, towards you away from these things that have been distracting me and knocking me off course. Let me pray for you. Jesus, I'm asking for each of us today. Lord, I feel the conviction <laughs> of, of this, this message. I feel it. And, and Lord, uh, Lord, any area in my life that, that you, you show me, God, I, I confess it today or in the future to come to Lord even as I was preparing this you were showing me some things and I confess those things to you and I repented of those things and I'm turning and and Lord I, I thank you for your incredible love thank you for your mercy thank you for forgiveness and your grace that covers uh, that and 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 Lord I Lord, but I don't want any wall, any barrier. And I pray that for my friends watching today, Lord, and tuning in. Lord, would, as, as, as you're convicting them right where they're at, would they just lift those situations up to you and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for this. Forgive me for this. And, and, and Lord, if there's practical things they need to do, Lord, to, to remove time in areas that are distracting them or taking them down a bad path, I, I pray that you'd show them and that they would not just think about it, but they'd do it. They'd do it. They'd change. They would repent and change direction in that area. And Lord, for all of us, I ask that you would increase our time with you, our time in the Word of God, just like Josiah, Lord. He hadn't heard the Word of God. And he not only has it read to him, but he reads it himself and he reads it to others. And it impacts him, it changes him. And Lord, if you, you say all the way back in Deuteronomy 17, you challenge the kings to do that, to have their own personal copy. God, thank you that we have so many personal copies of the Word of God available to us. It's not scarce. But Lord, would we not just have a copy? Would we read it? Would we get in it? Would we let it uh, churn the soil of our hearts up, God, and respond to it every day? 
<sighs> Thank you for that, Lord. And if there's anybody here, as you're, if, if you're like, Kevin, I don't even have a relationship with Jesus. I don't even know this personal God. Listen, Jesus, he made a way, right? He took your sin and my sin upon himself. And he, he, too, he was perfect. He never sinned, but yet he took your sin and my sin. Somebody had to pay a penalty for that sin. You and I couldn't live perfect lives. We can't live perfect lives. We need someone to stand in the gap for us. And that's what Jesus did. He takes your sin and my sin upon himself. He, pays, he paid the penalty with his life. And that was incredible. And he wasn't just a martyr. Jesus, he didn't stay dead. He rose again. He defeated death and defeated the effect of sin on our behalf. And then he says, I, and when he was resurrected, he comes to life and he says, I offer you a resurrected life. And if you say yes, if you receive what he accomplished for you, and I, it's like we get born again, we get spiritually reborn into this life with him. And so if you've never done that, just agree with this prayer. Dear Jesus, I just surrender my life to you. Forgive me of my sin. I ask that you would just help me to be born again by your spirit. I receive your gift of love and grace and forgiveness today. And I'm looking forward to walking this journey with you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Have an awesome week. Love you. Thank you for joining our River City Family Worship Service today. Our prayer is for you to experience the mighty power and presence of God every single day through this week. If this was your first time with us, please text RCC New to 97000. And if you surrendered your life to Jesus for the first time, we are so excited and we want to know more. So please text RCC Life to 97000 as well. You can also stick around and chat with your online host. Let us know how your day's gone. Let us know how the service was. Have a great week.